Hello and welcome to Future Self Dreaming. My name is Carlos Kukulkan. In the last presentation, I began to explain the events that led to my initial interactions with the architects of a body of work known as The Template, named Julia and Jeeva Carter. I described the impact that reading their book, World Bridger, had upon me, outlining that the guiding influence of this book they describe as the bird tribes, a term which may be associated with our higher selves or hyperdimensional transcendent aspect of ourselves. The presence of this non-linear aspect of self that exists beyond the influence of time and space was once again making itself known to me in a series of synchronicities that defied the explanation of my rational mind. And in this presentation, I'll follow on from these events to describe the synchronicities that led to an experience of ego dissolution. My grandmother had passed away on the 9th of the 9th, 09. Numerologically, nines represent completion or death and rebirth, so it seemed an appropriate day for her to transition. As a result of her passing, I inherited several thousand dollars, and after the synchronicities that I had uh, experienced in relation to the bird tribes while reading World Bridger, I intuitively felt that I needed to order all of the geometry used in the template ceremonies. So I had them sent over from Bali. And when this geometry arrived, pieces like this, I wasted no time in hanging up many pieces all around my bedroom. And then all manner of wild synchronicities began manifesting. I didn't know what I planned to do with these large brass geometric structures, but the intuitive prompting was so strong that I had to follow it and buy these pieces. So one morning shortly thereafter, I was out on a morning walk around Albert Park Lake near my residence at the time in Melbourne. And whilst out walking, I spontaneously started playing a very childlike game of witnessing and surrendering my ego. After listening to the monkey mind for a period of time, I began to say things to myself such as, I surrender, I give up, I've had enough, I surrender, you win. And evidently this was somewhat confusing to the mind chatter for a period of time and assisted in bringing my awareness into the moment and the beauty of the day and the environment that I was in. But inevitably, as I continued to walk, the ego mind would continue its monologue about the latest relationship drama that I was having or some other nonsense. And again, I would begin to reply with statements mocking this voice such as, yeah, that's right, you know best, you're the boss. I should pay more attention to you. In fact, I should roll out the red carpet to you. I bow down before you, your majesty. And ultimately, I would just continue to say, I surrender, I surrender. I can't do this anymore. And each time I would engage this internal dialogue and surrender further, my heart would begin to open and everything just seemed to get more beautiful as well as more humorous until I found myself in fits of laughter at my own internal joking, which was comprised of continually mocking the internal dialogue at the expense of my ego's antics. This process continued for about 40 minutes as I strolled around the lake until finally I found myself needing to lay down on the grass and I began to roll around in spontaneous fits of hysterical laughter for apparently no good reason. I was laughing so hard that I could hardly breathe and my mind persisted with its resistance, saying things like, get up, you can't be rolling around here in the park by yourself laughing like a maniac, people are going to look at you, pull yourself together, your nutcase. And witnessing this type of internal chatter just made it more humorous for me. And I continued to laugh in the uncontrollable manner we occasionally do with somebody at the most politically incorrect of moments, yet there was nobody there to share the joke with me. And I'd laughed myself into such an ecstatic state that as I lay upon the earth, bathed in the light of the sun, I felt that somehow I was in this tantric embrace with the cosmos and I was having a full-bodied orgasm with the fabric of reality. The joy coming as a result of feeling in full acceptance of what is. Now when I arrived home shortly thereafter, I switched on my computer and I began to surf the web with no particular agenda and without consciously searching for anything related to my experiences that morning, I inadvertently stumbled upon a YouTube link which referred to the ego, which I decided to open. And the first link I clicked on was a brilliant process outlining the nature of the ego from a wonderful teacher named David Hawkins, the author of Power vs. Force. The process is called, and then what? A way of transcending fears. He states, once one focuses on fear, the endless fearful events of the world feed it. Fear limits the growth of the personality and leads to inhibition. 
In this process, fears are allowed to arise without resistance and their emotional energy is surrendered as it arises. One starts with fearfulness and then surrenders to a consequence. For example, you might say, I'm afraid I will lose my job. And then you say, and then what? Well, then I won't have any money. And then what? And then I'll be thrown out of my house. And then what? And then I'll become homeless. And then what? And then I will worry that I won't have any money for food and we could starve to death. And then what? And then I could get sick and I could die. And so on and so forth. As each fear consequence is surrendered, the train of fears always terminates and ends up with the fear of physical death itself. Interestingly, the near-death experience subsequently eliminates all fear of death. Finally, when death is accepted and surrendered, the core of the fear drops away and peace can be the consequence of surrender to the inevitabilities of life. So I like this example from David Hawkins and found it curious that the process of self-observation that I had spontaneously begun participating in that morning was so similar. After viewing that process, I noticed another YouTube clip related to the ego and so decided to venture down the YouTube rabbit hole. The next clip was by an author named Stuart Wilde, which was an excerpt from an audio series that he compiled titled The Journey Beyond Enlightenment, where he explores the pitfalls of the spiritual ego obsessed with the trappings of enlightenment. I had read a couple of books by Stuart Wilde and found him to have a great sense of humour. Just listening to the bluntness of his opening lines on that clip made me laugh. He starts by stating, You may think that salvation comes from being chosen and special and part of some elite system. Dream on. He then continues, Elitism is very dark as it excludes others. In fact, deliverance comes from being ordinary and human and not needing to be special. Drop being special and you are already walking in the right direction. The ego builds a tower for you to live in. It feels safer, protecting you from dealing with people and experiencing pain and disappointment. You're elevated, in your mind anyway, above the crowd. And from there, you can gaze down on humanity through your separation and your imagined specialness. And you can sell yourself the idea that the destiny of ordinary people is not your destiny, that you've been elevated and chosen and made special. That is what the ego likes, to be higher and distanced from others. That is why the ego likes observers and glamour. Observers make the ivory tower of the ego more real, and that is why people boast and show off and make a great story of their minor achievements. They seek recognition and status. They seek altitude for their ivory tower. The ivory tower is sustained by the electricity of the ego. The more electricity a person has, the more they can become moody and capricious and self-centered. The moody, demanding pop star is an example of the electricity of the ego running rampant. To sustain the power of their importance and their divine-like status, they need constant attention, constant input. It's a high-maintenance lifestyle. The ego drives people to seek that status and the position over the others. Glitzy stuff, flashy cars, the red carpet, the VIP lounge, all create attention. The attention of others creates electricity for the ego. And through that incoming energy, the ego seeks to falsely elevate itself. It's our ego's way of raising itself up to the center stage. We seek electricity, external energy sources to hold us up. It helps us feel safe and less vulnerable. That is the illusion of specialness that comes from the ego's sense of separation. But that specialness comes at a terrible price, for in the isolation of elitism in the ivory tower, we become, we become ever so slightly mad. The electricity of the tower fries you in the end as you will need more and more to keep the illusion going. It blinds you to reason. You see only your mind and your ideals and your terms and definitions. So after enjoying Stuart Wilde's insights about the ego, I delved further down the rabbit hole into a series of clips that had the most profound effect on me. They were taken from a film titled Revolver by Guy Ritchie, producer Guy Ritchie. The, ex the excerpt was titled Releasing the Ego, the snippets that were taken from scenes near the end of this movie intrigued me immensely as they had an intensely transpersonal theme that I could relate to even only having seen a short portion of the entire movie. Now given that I was managing a cinema at the time, I found it strange that I hadn't heard of this particular film and so I googled it to find out more. 
Revolver had not been a great success at the box office and was later re-edited before release on DVD. I was fascinated to find out that producer Guy Ritchie, who was once married to Madonna, had been involved in Jewish mystical tradition of Kabbalism, and he had encoded many esoteric Kabbalistic themes into the storyline of Revolver. Jewish Kabbalah is a set of esoteric teachings meant to explain the relationship between God, the unchanging, eternal, and mysterious Ein Sof, or the infinite, and the mortal and finite universe, God's creation. So this mystical element caught my attention, and a couple of days later on my drive home from work at the cinema, an intuitive impulse suggested to me, you should go and see if you can find that movie at the DVD store. So I went in search of, of Revolver, which I located with the assistance of the store clerk. And I got home, had some dinner, and settled in on the couch uh, to watch this movie. It was quite late at night. Now, spoiler alert, I am going to explain the themes of this movie so as to elaborate further on the impact that it had on me and the events that followed. I'm also going to borrow from some of the writing found on the internet, uh, including the Liberated Lotus, the website called The Liberated Lotus by Matthew Micheletti. So this is a very clever psychological movie which needs you to think deeply rather than just be entertained. The themes in the movie are all related to the protagonist going through the process of an ego death or dissolution. The main character, named Jake Green, is played by Hollywood A-list actor Jason Statham. This here is the cover from the movie. You'll see Jason Statham's character in the center. And you will notice that in the writing of the title of the film Revolver is a chess piece. As this reference to the chessboard is a repeated motive throughout the, the film. So the plot. After spending seven years in solitary confinement and having his sister-in-law murdered, confidence tricks, trickster Jake Green, played by Jason Statham, is out to get revenge on Dorothy Macker, played by Ray Liotta, who is a violence-prone casino owner who sent Jake to prison. Jake Green is a hotshot con artist who has acquired a specific strategy referred to as the formula that is supposed to lead its user to win every game. The formula itself was discovered by two unnamed men in adjacent cells either side of Jake's own during his time in prison. During the first five years of his seven-year sentence, the three men communicated their thoughts about confidence tricks and chess moves via messages hidden inside provisional books, such as the mathematics of quantum mechanics. They planned to leave their cells simultaneously, but they end up leaving Jake behind, who ends up serving the remaining two years. He finds that all of his possessions and money have been taken by the two men with whom he had shared everything, but... Having the two men's formula, he goes about making a lot of money at various casinos. Two years later, Jake has garnered a reputation that leads many casinos to fear his freakishly good luck. The formula is seen to apply to any game and is often exemplified by his apparent mastery of chess. The story revol revolves around Jake's epiphanic waiting, awakening and as he, as he learns to apply the formula to the game of life. Jake goes to prison for seven years. While his reasons for the sentence are unspecified, it's implied that he was incarcerated due to the effects of Dorothy Macker, the corrupt casino owner. Approximately two years after his prison release, Jake, Billy, and another brother, Joe, walk into one of Macker's casinos to take revenge. All the tables are closed to Jake and company, and they are promptly called up to the private area of Macker's casino, where a high rollers game is currently taking place. Jake bets Macca a fortune on a chip toss and wins, and this hurts Macca. As Jake says, nothing hurts more than humiliation and a little money loss. He humiliates Macca in front of Macca's lieutenants, and Macca suspect, uh, suspects that Jake, who seems unafraid of him, will be out for more revenge. So Jake uses the knowledge of other people's Achilles heel, their place of personal weakness where their confidence can be affected. And Dorothy Macca's pride is hurt. He doesn't like being humiliated. As Jake says, Macca would prefer to eat a yard of his own shit before looking bad. Jake Green's Achilles heel is that he doesn't like being confined in tight places. He'd prefer to walk a flight of stairs than be contained in a claustrophobic elevator. 
So as Jake and his brothers leave the casino, he's confronted by an unknown character introduced as Zack, who is played by Vincent, Vincent Pastor. He hands him a strange business card that has something written on him that he shouldn't possibly be able to know. It reads, take the elevator. Now Jake ignores this message and instead takes the stairwell and collapses down the stairs unexpectedly and is rushed to hospital. The doctors report that he's very ill but they do not disclose why he had the blackout. After Macca's pride is humiliated, he puts out an order for a hit on Jake. When Jake arrives home, one of Macca's hitmen is waiting inside. And upon arrival, there is another one of these strange business cards waiting on the doormat, which states, pick this up. And as Jake Green reaches down to grab it, bullets fly through the door, missing Jake and resulting in him being the only one who survives. He's then rescued by the mysterious individual called Zack, who had left the calling card. Zack then introduces Jake to his partner, Avi, played by Andre Benjamin. When Jake meets Avi, he is in a room full of tables with chessboards upon them and invites Jake to have a game with him. This is one of many scenes involving the chessboard. Avi explains that they have already proven that they can save his life, but the next time they do so will not be for free and that if Jake wants their help, help he'll need to pay for it. He explains that Jake only has three days left to live and not to ask how they know this. Now Jake, being a master con artist and confidence trickster, thinks that he's being conned. However, Abby, being a move ahead of him, preempts this as though he knows what Jake will be thinking. He states that Jake is not being conned and that he may wish to go to the doctor to get a second opinion. Jake finds out that the blackout occurred due to a rare blood disease which will cause his death within three days and also that Macker is out to get him. Avi says that only he and Zach can protect him and that, in return, Jake must give him all their money to fund their loan shark enterprise. Now, Jake's mind struggles to come to terms with this predicament of his impending death and his mind wants to convince him that the doctor is in on this con as well. He is left, however, in a situation with no options other than to trust these two characters who he thinks are conning him and who go about making him give away the monetary fortune that he's amassed, causing him great suffering. Little does he know or realize at first, but this is the beginning of a process of breaking Jake's ego. Zack and Avi have put him in conflict with the greatest enemy to ever exist that hides in the last place he will want to look within himself. Now, throughout the initial stages of the film, Jake does not even know that this enemy exists. Abby and Zack force Jake to induce head pain to engage the enemy by making him give away the money under the principle that nothing hurts more than humiliation and a little money loss. They are inflicting this form of premature enlightenment upon Jake because, according to them, he was not ready to hear how hard this process of liberation was going to be whilst in prison. Jake is told that he can be protected by Zack and Abby, who are the loan sharks for the next three days, but it's only under certain conditions. There are no questions or negotiations. They will take every penny that he owns, taking his investment slowly as to make it harder for the ego to watch it be taken away piece by piece. By inflicting so much pain on the ego, the opponent, the ego, surfaces and is made readily observable. Do as we tell you with no argument, answer any question that is asked. Jake is being stripped of all choice and independence as well as the ego's entitlement to always being right. This process is demeaning and humbling to Jake, stripping him of all pride and attachment. All of this is compounded with the fact that Jake is supposed to die within the next couple of days, which begs the question, why would he spend his last few days as a slave to these two men? This fact is crucial in surfacing the ego since it doesn't technically matter what happens to his money seeing that he can't take it with him after he dies. Jake asks himself why it still hurts to give this money away. This of course is his ego's investment being identified and taken from it which creates suffering through the ego's projection of importance of the investment in this money. Jake thinks to himself about losing his money these thoughts include, a part of me dies every time I think about it. These sick bastards are making me pay, pay for my own pain. Why are they dragging this on? 
Why don't they just clean me out in one hit? They want me to suffer. A character who is never seen, named Sam Gold, is seen as being the king of, on this chessboard, this game of gang warfare. He is the ultimate figure that all men who are supposed to be aspiring to. Sam Gold is revealed to be ultimately a powerless, powerless cipher whose power is granted only by those who invest in him. He represents ego and self-investment. He is the personification of greed. Avi attempts to get Jake to understand the nature of the ego. He tells Jake that the greatest con that the ego ever pulled was making you believe that he is you. This is seen to be the ultimate con in that nobody wants to sever their connection with their ego because they refuse to challenge their own lifelong investment in it. Throughout the film, there are clever quotes that come from various sources, but all essentially speak of ego-related qualities or ideals, such as, the greatest enemy will hide in the last place you will ever look. The only way to get smarter is by playing a smarter opponent. The first rule of business, protect your investment. There is no avoiding war. It can only be postponed to the advantage of your enemy. And every game, in every game, there is a con. In, sorry, every game or con, there is always an opponent and always a victim. The trick is to know when you're the latter so you can become the former. The themes of ego gratification include those of greed, envy, lust, attachment and power. The film gives a perfect example of all the common thoughts and belief systems that the ego uses to maintain control. Also, in an effect to transcend the ego, it shows how desperate the ego can become. We see how Jake's ego has invested itself in money and losing it causes him physical and psychological torment. While Jake was in prison, he spent time locked between these two convicts, one who turned out to be a master chess master and the other a master con man. Basically, the th three of them passed these notes to each other through these books that get handed out each day. The two had come up with this ultimate formula to the con, the ego, known as the formula. Jake intercepted the formula and used it when he got out of prison, which is how he amassed a fortune in a very short time. However, the formula is much deeper than what he thinks. The formula is the formula of the ego, the original and ultimate con, which must, which means rather, that it is also the formula to transcendence. Once we understand how the ego works and its formula for survival, so to speak, then we can defeat or transcend it by using that knowledge against it. Throughout this three-day process that Avi and Zach put Jake through, they continue to discuss the rules of the formula to the game while playing on the chessboard. Jake continually wins and Avi asked how he got so good at the game, so Jake explains his winning formula. Jake discusses the rules. Each rule is referring to ego manipulation or ego ideals. Essentially, all cons are just form of manipulating a Mark's ego. That's why the number one rule to being a con artist is that you cannot con an honest man. In other words, a person who's aware or conscious enough to fall for a trick being played on their ego. Ultimately, the ego is the master con artist because even con artists are being conned by their egos, telling them that they need to steal. Whilst moving pieces around on the chessboard, Jake explains the rules of the con to Abby, stating the formula has infinite depth in its eff efficacy and application, but it's staggeringly simple and completely consistent. The art is for me to feed pieces to you and make you think that you took those pieces because you're smarter and I'm dumber otherwise known as ego inflation. In every game of con, there is always an opponent, the ego, and there's always a victim, the self. The more control the victim thinks that it has, the less control he actually has. Gradually, he'll hang himself, as I, the opponent, the ego, just help him along. So the opponent simply distracts their victim by getting them consumed with their own consumption, asking, what's in it for me? Ego, desires such as pride, narcissism. However, if this doesn't work, work, he, the ego, will smother, humiliate, ridicule, or utterly destroy the, th the threat. This is ego self-preservation, 
anything that is starting to set us free from the ego, the ego will find reasons to hate it and destroy it or mentally or physically. So the bigger the trick and the older the trick, the easier it is to pull based on two principles. They think that it can't be that old and it can't be that big for so many people to have fallen for it. And the more that the victim invests, the less chance that they will have to turn back. The more invested and attached we are to our ego's promises, the harder it is to transcend it and let them go. So eventually when the opponent, the ego, is challenged or questioned, it means that the victim's investment and thus his intelligence, his intelligence is questioned and nobody can accept that, not even to themselves. Identifying the ego for what it is can be extremely difficult for the mind to accept. It also implies that the majority of the person's life has been controlled and in chasing after illusions of security and identity and depression and suicide can often be a result uh, depending on the scale of attachment and the use of support systems. So if we, if we pay attention to these rules of the con, you see that they are basically an outline for how the ego operates and controls us, that is if we choose to let it. The ego's self-destruction is described through the process of greed, pure ego desire. Avi states they think that they can handle her, but greed is the only snake that cannot be tamed. Greed gets them in the all, gets them all in the end. So Avi and Zach test Jake on this formula, telling him that they have put him to war with the only enemy that ever existed, telling Jake. You've heard that voice for so long. You believe it to be you. You believe it to be your best friend. They ask him, do you know who Sam Gold is? Attempting to have him recognize his ego, explaining, it's all up here, pretending to be you. You're in the game, Jake. Everyone's in this game and nobody knows it. And all of this, this is his world, the ego's world. He owns it. He controls it. He tells you what to do and when to do it. They explain, play by his rules and you're controlled by his rules. Eventually you'll lose. But if you change the rules on what controls you, you will change the rules on what you can control. They point out that Jake thinks the ego's voice is his best friend, but that hiding in Jake's pain is the ego. And for him to win this game, he must induce head pain and go to war with this enemy. They ask, how radical are you prepared to be, Mr. Green? The more power you think you have in gold's world, the less you have in the real world. They tell him, you are still in prison, Jake. In fact, you never left. So, the last scenes in the movie were the ones that I had watched on the YouTube clips a couple of days earlier. The cinematography is brilliant as it splits into these scenes where Jake is having an internal battle with the real enemy within himself that he's now fully engaged with. These scenes take place as Jake enters the bedroom of Mr. Macca to repent and ask for forgive forgiveness. These are keys related to Jake's transcendence. Jake had been told by Avi and Zach, wherever you don't want to go is where you will find him, into his fears, asking him, what is it that you're afraid of, Mr. Green? And giving him the tactic to use your perceived enemy to destroy the real enemy. This is the ego projection onto an externalized enemy. They tell Jake to give Maka what he wants, and in asking for forgiveness from the perceived enemy, Maka, he accepts inferiority to the enemy and loves him, letting go of all pride. Jake battles his ego to ask forgiveness from his perceived enemy, Mr. Maka, and subject himself to being seen as possibly inferior. He asks for forgiveness for his stupidity, in other words, openly admitting humiliation to his perceived enemy. This is a major transcendence of ego by releasing the idea of an enemy in the first place. Jake's ego throughout the plea for forgiveness is begging Jake to kill his enemy, Mr. Macca, and take control and establish pride, vengeance and dominance. Also, the ego uses all past information as its supporting information. Jake's ego in this situation is using everything Mac has ever done to wrong him as reasons to seek revenge. And this is also characteristic of egoic thinking, living in the past and never staying in the present moment, thus holding grudges. Furthermore, the ego uses the argument that he'd do it to you. This, of course, is erroneous to assume the enemy's position and is in fact 
the very act of creating an enemy in the first place. Everyone, every time one chooses love and forgiveness, one is overcoming ego tendencies. So after apologizing and asking for forgiveness from Mr. Macca, Jake leaves the bedroom to go into the elevator, which is Jake's greatest fear, claustrophobia. This is yet another enemy that was created by his ego. As Jake leaves one major battle with the ego in the bedroom of Mr. Macca, he heads to his next battle, faced between a choice of taking the stairwell or entering the elevator. So, of course, he must face his fears and chooses to get in the elevator. He then becomes stuck between the 14th and the 12th floor. This, of course, is Jake's greatest fear coming to life. He had been told, wherever you don't want to go, there you will find him, the ego hiding within his fears. Jake's ego even asks him, are you doing this to yourself, Jake? This is the first question that the ego asks to begin its onslaught of fear, fearful thoughts attacking and invading Jake's mental peace while in the elevator scene. The ego starts whispering in Jake's ear, trying to convince him that his fears are real, saying, it's tight in here, Jake, we've got to get out. However, there is no actual danger. Jake is simply standing in the middle of a stopped elevator. He's in no real physical danger. However, the ego is trying to control Jake and make him anxious and fearful. This is how all ego mechanics work. It is fear-based. Fear that is ultimately rooted in the fear of death. However, Jake is beginning to realize that this is all an illusion and is becoming aware of the ego at this point. Jake replies, I can hear you. I'm on to you. Sensing that Jake's self is onto it, the ego battles with every possible argument it has, that Jake is mistaken and that he is talking to himself, saying, what, Jake, you're going to trust new people, people that want to hurt you. I'm your old friend, Jake. I say you do. Jake replies that the ego is not in control. And the ego argues, oh, you want to get rid of me, do you, Jake? Okay. And then pulls out a gun, shoots himself in the head, falls down, and then jumps back up laughing maniacally, saying, you can't kill me, Jake, because I am you. Basically, the ego wants Jake to think that he's really just arguing with himself. Jake is aware, however, and rejects all the ego's attempts to regain control. Avi's voice is narrating during these scenes, stating that the biggest con that he, the ego, ever pulled is making you believe that he is you. After this battle has raged within Jake's mind for a few minutes, he reaches a level of transcendence through the realization that you, the ego, don't control me, the observer, consciousness, the true self, as this self controls the ego. Upon this realization, Jake is truly free and the ego is completely transcended in that moment. Jake is in an enlightened state at this point. This is symbolized by the lights coming back on in the elevator as it starts to descend to the ground floor. Jake is at peace finally, since there is no ego keeping him in constant states of fear, anxiety, separation, inflation, investment, lack, or need for approval. Upon arriving at the ground floor, Macca has raced down the stairwell and is waiting with a gun pointed at Jake, demanding an answer for Jake's unusual or non-egoic behavior to fear for his life. Macca's ego is begging to be feared, asking, what's your game? You come in here to my home. I'm going to kill you like the dog that you are. And since Jake has no reason to fear anymore, he is unaffected by Macca's threats because he has transcended the ego's illusion of threat being possible. Spiritual transcendence of the ego realizes that there is no end to the self and thus there is no real fear in the traditional sense, seeing how all fear eventually, when traced to the source thought, stems from fear of death. At the end of the movie, Jake has stepped off the proverbial chessboard, making a conscious effort to reverse everything that the ego tells him to do. This is seen to be the truest and most fundamental application of the formula. The characters of Jake, Zach, Avi and Sorter are seen to ultimately reject the ego's rules, while the character of Dorothy Macker is seen to succumb to them. 
As the credits roll, there are clips from interviews with psychologists and doctors about the concept of the ego. So with this quite long plot summarization being kept in mind, having watched the movie by myself that evening, I was completely engrossed in the film from beginning to end. And at times I found myself so heavily associated with the transpersonal themes in this movie that great surges of emotion were aroused as I remembered incident, instances when I'd been in very similar circumstances to the protagonist. I would think to myself, I know this scene, I've been down this path before. The themes throughout Revolver completely gripped me and while heavily associated to these themes, it began to bring the walls of my own ego down and I felt a merging taking place. The cinematography and music in the forgiveness and elevator scenes at the climax of the movie are superb, and it were these scenes that I had initially viewed on YouTube a couple of days earlier. The constant reference to the game of life symbolized by the chessboard prevailed throughout the movie. Multiple scenes involve chessboards and the discussion about the art of the formula. At the immediate conclusion of the credits, I was laying on the couch, feeling my way deeply into the transpersonal power of the messages conveyed in the movie, staring at the screen on which appeared the name of a preview for another movie called The Spirit, when all of a sudden my home phone rang, which I thought was extremely unusual. I thought, why would anybody be ringing me at this time of night? And besides, who is it likely to be ringing me after midnight? So I'd only given my home phone number to a handful of people and the phone line was only connected for internet use. Everybody else just called me on my mobile number. So I thought, it's not likely to be any of my friends or family at this time of night and the only other people likely to call the telemarketers, but it's not likely to be them at this time of night either. The timing of the ringing at the immediate conclusion of the movie seemed strange and uncanny. I considered it was simply likely to be a wrong number, but I had an unusual compulsion to answer it all the same. So I answered saying, hello, this is Carlos. And the voice on the other end said to me, hello, is this the boardroom? And then he immediately hung up. And I took a deep breath and allowed the impact of that question to sink in. The multiple scenes and references within this movie to the chessboard played over in my mind. Is this the boardroom? The question stopped me in my tracks and the voice of my intuition whispered to me, you've just received a call from spirit. It appeared in that moment that when higher self wants to manifest, it can do so seemingly in whatever form is appropriate. And in this case, it was through a random phone call in the middle of the night directly after watching a movie involving chessboards and a man going through the death of his ego. I'd had enough of these synchronicities in my life to recognize the perfection of that moment. And at that point, I became unglued. It destroyed me. It brought apart my sense of self and I just sat down and let myself unravel beyond my ar arrogance, beyond my anger, past my isolation and into the humility of that moment. I sat in the middle of my lounge room crying and surrendering further and just letting it all go. As Robert Anton Wilson would say, the doors to Chapel Perilous had been flung open. I had entered into Hermann Hesse's magic theatre in which the entrance is not for everybody. It is for madmen only. I sat in my lounge room emptied, but that phone call was only the catalyst or a cosmic trigger as Robert Anton Wilson would call it for a chain of events that would unfold over the next few days. So the next morning, whilst in a staff meeting, I shared my experience the night before with some work colleagues over a morning bre breakfast meeting, and the looks on their faces were priceless. The response from several of them was that if they'd received a phone call like that in the middle of the night, it would freak them out. And they all wanted to know whether I had tried to get back in contact with the man who had phoned me. And I laughed at the immediate projection of fear onto that scenario and attempted to explain that these are acts of power or, or of spirit, synchronicities, and that we have the choice as to how we want to perceive, interpret or add meaning to them. That in a state of ego-based fear or paranoia, I might have chosen to think that the CIA was listening through the walls 
calling me up on the phone to fuck with my mind and to whisper a few key trigger messages designed to uh, trigger some MK Ultra mind control programming. However, we can also choose to perceive from a miraculous mindset and realize that the central intelligence of our heart from that central intelligence that the holy guardian angel as described in Kabbalism also known as the higher self or the bird tribes or whatever other name you want to use to reference that level of consciousness will sometimes seemingly manifest as outside of yourself to remind you about the interconnect interconnectedness of it all and upgrade the brain's metaprogramming circuits. So after this staff meeting, I went out for lunch with one of the other managers who I had just shared this experience with of watching Revolver. And the first voice that we heard directly from behind us as we walked onto the sidewalk yelled out, his ego is impenetrable. And I turned around to see two young men behind us and I asked her, do you see what's going on here? Do you see the holographic nature of this event, the synchronicity of the theme of the ego in this occasion? And then I began to laugh as the cosmic joke of it all was beginning to permeate me. Now, over the next three days, I rapidly entered into some weird state of cosmic consciousness where I seemingly had a female voice talking to me for days on end. Now, this may have been what Carl Jung describes as the anima. This may well have been the female voice of my intuition personified or both hemispheres of my brain communicating with each other better than they usually do or maybe I was just too high on cacao smoothies, but whatever was going on, I had some, uh, this voice had some seemingly profound stuff, stuff to say, and it made me constantly, endlessly laugh whilst playing these ridiculous perceptual games inspired by having watched the movie Revolver to dissolve my ego further. And whilst pa participating in these games, I simply could not stop laughing for hours on end each day whilst in my own company. The games that had me play all involved surrendering of attachment, forgiveness, following the bliss of my heart, and observing any time that my mind attempted to project fear onto anyone. The witness or observer consciousness in me had switched into overdrive, and the more ludicrous nonsense that my egoic mind would come up with, the harder that I laughed. The more I laughed, the happier I felt. My heart was opening wider and wider with each belly laugh, and I began to feel so high as though I'd taken some serious drugs. Now, I once heard a quote that laughter is much better than prayer because when we pray, we tend to take ourselves very seriously. But when we laugh, our sense of self disappears. And the more that I laughed, the more that my sense of self disappeared. So I had the desire to go to a bathhouse uh, at some mineral springs in an area that I frequently visited called Hepburn Springs, which was just over an hour's drive from Melbourne. Usually I would have gone with a friend uh, for the day to rejuvenate in these waters at the bathhouse. However, I was having trouble finding anyone to join me for an outing, so I decided to go on an adventure with this voice that was navigating at the helm. I drank a large smoothie full of cacao and other superfoods, and I laughed myself all the way to Dalesford. I got lost when I arrived, which wasn't surprising given, given my state of mind, but everything had become an adventure at that point, and I found a track to go on a bushwalk. And in the brisk winter air, the walk felt as though I was in some magical wonderland. It was exciting, as though uh, this adventure was into an unknown world. Somehow, everything seemed much more alive than it usually did. The voice was explaining that the liquid crystal of underground water in that area made it a very special place, that it was somehow connected to the mystical realm of Avalon. Now, there were many opportunities for me to turn back and go back to my car, but each time I would go around the next hill or over a bend uh, following the stream that I was walking along, I just kept wanting to go further and further. And the land landscape began to change with each leg of this new journey. Some areas had lots of water, others had quartz crystals scattered around the ground, uh, many amazing trees and birds. And after about an hour or so of walking, I came to this small area filled with pine trees rather than Australian eucalypts. And the energy there felt quite different. And the voice began to explain that this was a fairy ring. Uh, as I walked curiously through these pine trees, it wasn't long before my gaze was caught by a couple of luminous red and white mushrooms that were growing beneath the trees and I began to inspect them. 
below one of these mushrooms there was some type of worm that was curled up into a spiral and I gazed upon it in this trance-like state that I was in and my mind seemed to telescope in on that worm and I had the image of Alice in Wonderland in my mind with the talking worm sitting upon the magic mushroom smoking a pipe. Memories about the use of magic mushrooms from books that I'd read by author Robert Anton Wilson began to emerge in my mind and I remembered something about these famed Amanita muscaria that grew in symbiotic union with pine trees and that when ingested they had a psychedelic effect that perhaps affected the pineal gland. Now I'd never taken any psychedelic substances in my life at that stage and I wasn't about to ingest these mushrooms but just being in such an open state the presence of these mushrooms seemed to have some type of energetic effect on me that sent me further into my own journey into Wonderland. Now after spending a while with these mushrooms I continued to walk for another couple of hours the voice was telling me to go and sit in a small cave that I'd found and when I emerged I came upon a symbol or a mandala that was carved into a tree and the voice told me to take a photo of this. Later that night when I returned home after being to the bathhouse I got on the internet and of course up popped this image of the symbol or the mandala that I'd found carved into the tree. It was a symbolic image from Carl Jung's writings known as the Red Book and seemed to represent the blazing sun. As I read on I discovered that Jung had an imaginary friend or muse that he called Philemon which represented superior insight and functioned like a guru to him. When once asked who is Philemon, Jung stated, only myself. So discovering Jung's imaginary friend and guru helped me to feel mildly saner about the internal voice that was yapping on relentlessly. And I'm just going to move this so it stops banging around. The next day, I was even more loose than I was in the days previous. I had laughed at the most ludicrous things over those past few days which continued while I was at work each evening whilst I was attempting to manage 20 staff members and I could not stop laughing even when I was at work. After a couple of hours of being there I basically hardly knew who I was anymore. I was so heavily associated with everything and everyone around me. Nothing mattered, nothing had any great meaning and I didn't really care because it was all seemingly so funny and I was just letting the operations at the cinema run themselves uh, while this voice was making analogies about the movie projectors being like the mind projecting images onto the screen of our mind. On a couple of occasions that evening random customers would make eye contact with me and come across the room a little bit confused looking asking uh, how did we know you? We've met before, maybe it was at a party or something and this amused me further and the voice continued to tell me that this was occurring simply because I was in such an expanded state that these people were unknowingly recognizing something about themselves in my state at that time. Now that night after work I went home exhausted and fell sound asleep but I woke up several hours later to find myself in a complete panic sweating and hyperventilating after having a dream that my pineal gland was going to explode in a burst of light and completely annihilate me. After I'd sufficiently calmed myself down, I decided that my state of being at that time was a bit too expanded, a bit too manic, a little bit too out there, and that perhaps it was time to come back to Earth softly rather than with a crash landing. So I plotted a course of return that involved having some acupuncture and massage the following day to get me grounded and back in my body. So the following day, after receiving some body work and finally feeling like I was grounded again, I went back to work and when I arrived one of the other ma managers who had not been aware of any of the experiences that I'd had over the past week says to me excitedly, guess what Carl, guess who I met yesterday, you'll never guess who it was. And I said, I don't know, who was it? She says, actually it was just after you arrived at work, I went into one of the gold class cinemas to check on a customer who had requested service with a call light. And guess who it was? It was that actor, Jason Statham. And I thought to myself at this point, you're fucking kidding me, aren't you? Is she serious? You mean to tell me that after I've watched this movie Revolver a few days starring that actor, then received a phone call in the middle of the night at its conclusion and spent the last three days walking around completely off my perch, 
that now of the several billion people on the planet who could perchance happen to come into my workplace, it's the main actor from that movie. What are the chances of that occurring really? So I thought to myself that if I had have checked on the call light and seen him there in the state that I was in, that I would have completely lost my mind. And I asked, are you sure it was him? And she says, yeah, I'm positive. I saw him come out of the cinema at the end as well. And then the voice that had been chatting to me all week casually states, don't worry, you're going to have your opportunity to energetically bridge this event. So a couple of days go past, my pineal gland seemingly hasn't exploded, or maybe it did. But I returned to work on a busy weekend shift where generally all the cinemas were sold out due to popular movie screenings. And everything at the cinema was flowing smoothly into, until two of the staff members come to me for assistance due to having a ticketing error. They said, we seem to have a double booking in one of the cinemas and we can't find the tickets reserved for these gentlemen in the foyer. We're going to go down to the office to see if the tickets are there. Um, the, the previews have just started and could I go over and see these gentlemen in the foyer? So I said, sure, being used to dealing with customer relationships as the manager of the cinema. I casually stroll over to where these two men were sitting in the foyer and introduced myself as the manager on duty. The gentleman on my left was concealed under a cap that he was wearing, busily texting a message on his mobile phone. However, he glanced at me momentarily and as I introduced myself, I realized that it was the actor from that movie, Revolver, Jason Statham. So I explained to them, gentlemen, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. We have a ticketing er error. I'll have you to your, your seat shortly. And then I took the opportunity to introduce myself and ask to him. I said, excuse me, I hope you don't mind asking, but your name is Jason, isn't it? He confirmed this. And I said to him, listen, I wouldn't usually bother you in this manner like some star starstruck fan. However, I've had a rather unusual experience this week that resulted from having watched the movie Revolver that you starred in. And I feel that I, that I need to share it with you. So both Jason and the man with him named Steve Chasman, who's the producer of a new movie that they were filming in Melbourne, began to give me their full attention. Now, obviously, I didn't need to relay to them the themes of this movie. However, I told them about the events leading up to me watching it and about the phone call that I'd received at the conclusion of watching it and what had been occurring since. As I was speaking, I was simultaneously in a place of observing this entire scenario that was unfolding and thinking, that voice told you that you were going to need to energetically bridge this event. And now here you are, speaking with the lead actor who's played the archetypal role of a man going through the dissolution of his ego. Well, it's not every day that you meet a complete stranger, let alone a, a, an A-lister Hollywood celebrity, and like a lunatic, tell them that you've had a voice in your head explaining the nature of reality after you've watched a movie that they've starred in, and that, that that voice happened to mention that you were destined to meet, but he seemed to take that piece of information pretty well. And after listening to me, he replies in his thick English accent, you know, I know someone who'd be real interested in that story, the writer and producer of that movie, Guy Ritchie. He put a lot of interesting themes into that script and not many people understood them, but you obviously did. And I replied that I thought that I was still coming to terms with some of those themes. Shortly thereafter, I had them seated in their cinema and I began to contemplate, how has this all occurred? What sort of divine cosmic architect has been involved in this plan? Am I that architect? Was there some sort of pre-planned orchestration from myself in the future? It was as though I had received one of those calling cards from the movie telling me about something that was going to occur in the future, something that my rational mind couldn't quite comprehend. I came home from work that evening and in my bedroom I looked around at all the geometry that I'd hung and I thought to myself, I think I've sold the family cow for some magic beans. The next synchronicity in this chain of events came in the days after as I told my friend Jules who was a mushroom alchemist all about the experiences, the experiences that I'd had with the movie Revolver, the encounter that I had had with Jason Statham and the Amanita mushrooms. He called and said, dude, I've got this book that you have to read. So I went to his house to read this book, and it was one that I had been reading about by Robert Anton Wilson. It was called The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. This is the cover from it. I picked the book up, 
and I opened it randomly to the beginning of chapter called The Star of the Morning. So here I was again with the influence of the morning star, the guiding light that I have described in previous presentations in relation to the consciousness of these mushrooms uh, and the experiences of ego dissolution that I just had. But we'll get to that information about the mushrooms in the next presentation. It was in a few weeks after these experiences that I booked in to do a workshop in Byron Bay to complete further template ceremonies with Juliet and Jeter Carter. I had already had the geometry for all their earlier ceremonies and I knew that they weren't training ambassadors. Uh, this was not high on their list of pri pri priorities, but I secretly hoped that I might have the opportunity to ask them about that possibility. When I arrived at the workshop and reintroduced myself to Juliet after seven years, she responded that she was glad that I came because they'd had their antennas on and had been told that it might be a good idea to get me on board. So they invited me to Bali to train as an ambassador. It seemed at that point that all the events that had been leading up to that moment related to my experiences with the bird tribe consciousness and the non-dual encounter into cosmic consciousness that I'd seemed to enter into as a result of having all this geometry hanging around me in conjunction with watching this movie called Revolver. These had all been in preparation for the next leg of my journey that my future self had designed. So I quit my job, booked a flight to Bali, and I spent the next seven years traveling endlessly facilitating the templates sacred geometry ceremonies. Now to close this presentation, I would like to deeply thank the master alchemist and movie producer Guy Ritchie for encoding this movie Revolver which, with such supremely transpersonal power and to Matthew Micheletti for decoding these themes in his writing so perfectly. Please be advised that if you're going to watch the movie Revolver, some people might consider it quite violent and vulgar. However, the scenes in this movie perfectly depict the characteristics and themes of the ego gone wild. And as usual, if you'd like to continue this journey with me in more episodes of Future Self Dreaming, please hit the subscribe button and you can check out offerings on the website futureselfdreaming.com and follow Future Self Dreaming on Instagram and Facebook. In Lakesh.